It's so true. <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you watch it, you suddenly, even with one other person, you're like, oh my God, that's so indulgent. Why on earth did I do that? <laughs> even as one other person, it's like, it's, yeah. it's all exposed, isn't it? All those kind of things that you think are going to be all right. Tonight, we are celebrating the female craft voices amongst this year's editing nominees. They'll be sharing how they shaped their compelling stories across drama and documentary. Sarah, and I have this in my notes, but I want to know if it's true. Is it true that you agreed to edit the series before it was even written? No. <laughs> I think that's come from... <laughs> of course not. I, that's come from... Um, I did a podcast and <laughs> I basically told Matt from Avid that I kind of agreed. I got an email and in the subject it said, Russell T Davis and Peter Hall. And I said, yes, uh-huh. oh, you know, <laughs> oh, who's going to say no if it's those two people? So no, I, of course I did. <laughs> it was well written by then, um, but I, I, I didn't hesitate. Mm. To- offer myself up I mean I'm glad we we, we (laughs) corrected the record as well here but you edited the entire series with just your assistant editor I believe um can you talk a little bit about the decision of keeping this story and the process so close to you and with such a a a very very small team considering the the size and the scope of the of the series so when Peter Hall the director came on board Mm. He, when he was off, he said, I, need, I, you, I, I think he said, don't quote me, but I'm pretty sure he said, I have to do it every, every episode. Mm-hmm. So as an editor, it makes sense for one editor to work with him mm-hmm. um, rather than sort of sharing out rushes. It does happen, and, and I've worked mm-hmm. with, with a, one director and multiple editors have worked at the same time with them. But I, this was my, I think it was my fourth time with Peter. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a brilliant assistant, Daniel. Um, so rushes were always ready first thing. It was, you know, a lot of footage. We're talking about, I know it's not comparable to documentary because you're finding a narrative and we had a script, but he did work out. We had 135 hours of material for five hours of TV which is quite a lot, mm-hmm. 27 to 1 or something ratio. Um, but because I knew, knew Peter well, I was working from home, actually mm-hmm. saved you a lot, a lot of time in commuting. Um, I kind of managed it. <laughs> um, and Russell's scripts are pretty concise and economical anyway. Mm-hmm. It's not like they were filming loads too many scenes yeah. that ended up on the, you know on the cutting mm-hmm. room floor um so yeah I kind of managed to keep afloat just about <laughs> and a congratulations on your nomination and I wanted to start by asking you about the process of dealing with such a huge amount of, of footage and how do you find the characters in that and that massive information and footage available to you well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, it took a long, long time um, across three episodes to get the narrative right. Um, and there was quite a lot of talking between all three edits and our director, James Blumel. We had an amazing resource of archive and it was just incredible. And you're also dealing with something which is still ongoing. <laughs> I mean, when we were editing Pandemic, we were still in the middle of it. So we didn't really know what the end was gonna be. So we had to set this kind of end of the end of the year. Um, but I'd started editing it in November. So I didn't know what was gonna happen between November and the 31st of December. Um, so there were, it whittled down my episode to kind of, I think it was four main characters. And mm-hmm. at the beginning, I just created story arcs within them. So I knew that somehow they were gonna to mesh together. And there was one in particular, a pastor in America, who I uh, laid out his story, uh, first of all. And then I, once I knew the highs and lows, the others kind of intermeshed. And, and I was in constant dialogue with my amazing archive producer, Miriam Walsh, and who was just a genius. Mm. So she was feeding me things almost kind of on request. So there was mm. lots of archive coming in, her and her assistant as well, uh, 
Dora were, were sort of constantly on the scrounge for stuff. And we and sometimes that was visual and sometimes that was logical or um, intellectual. And it took a lot of piecing together. So in, in my film, the transitions are kind of as important as sometimes the big meta narrative. So mm -hmm. it was sewing together those little things and handing over one character to another that, that in the end, I think helped form the narrative. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it was, a it was very, very difficult. You mentioned that you'd worked on documentaries before. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach this project with that feeling in mind that you're editing a fictional series that's based on a true case, on a true story, and also kind of is fitting into the, the a format that is very familiar to all of us now of true crime dramas? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think that the important thing for the production was to kind of, I, I, I think there's a character in in the story, Tabitha, who's the stepmother, who um, Christopher rings because they're at the end of their tether, they've suddenly been, they've run out of money, they've gone to Lille, um, they're running away from the fact that 50 years previously they buried the parents or allegedly buried uh, her parents in the back garden of the of a house in Mansfield, and he rings her to spill the beans, let's say. And um, basically, she is the character that tells us, you know, that it's not her story to tell. So um, I think that there was different ways of telling the story throughout the four episodes. Um, yeah, it was. It was really trying to tell the story of this couple, and they're ordinary couple, but sort of. Um, the romance, their rom romance and their story of how they got together, but also not telling the audience actually we're not, we're just telling a story. We're not, it's not true. It's whatever you interpret it, it's however you see it. And we're giving you all this, all the different angles of the story, the different sides of the story. So for example, um, the black and white is how Susan saw her past. The myth is their version of the story of what happened on the Maybank holiday when the parents were buried in the garden uh, 15 years earlier. And um, yeah, so so it's trying to bring, it was, it's almost like, not that it was like a documentary, but there were so many elements to the drama and there were so many different elements to bring together mm -hmm. that the important thing was, is to bring those ele elements and don't, and still be able to tell the story in a way that would draw people in. Because I think, you know, there's a danger if you're, if there's so many elements that you're not quite focused on, on how the story's been told. So um, yeah, that was the idea really. It's, this is, this is for everyone. How do you deal with being too close to the work? How do you retain a fresh viewpoint when you're working on something? Ellen, you're get not someone else in the room. Get someone yeah. else in the room. Have your sister, get anyone in the room. <laughs> it's so get true. When you, it. <laughs> when you watch it, you suddenly, even with one other person, you're like, oh my God, that's so indulgent. Why on earth did I do that? <laughs> even as one other person, it's like, it's, it's all exposed, isn't it? All those kind of things that you think are going to be all right. Suddenly you're like, oh no. And when you're in the pandemic <laughs> and you're working from home, there's no one to give you, you know, and, they, and they're still saying, can you do the assembling from home and you're going, oh, it'd be quite nice to have my assistant to come in and look at it and go, oh no, <laughs> just having, like you said, someone there to, to cause you yeah, that, see it differently. That is the horrible thing. We were having like BBC viewings and everyone was just like, okay, we'll press play at home now and then we'll talk yeah. afterwards. And it's just awful because you always want to steal a look at the person on the sofa <laughs> and see if they're laughing and oh yeah, they yeah, laughed yeah. at it. That's great. <laughs> Important and I really missed it. That I think there's no there's no substitute for live um, viewings at all. Absolutely, I know that most directors I work with want live viewings. They hate it mm. when when execs go, "Oh no, can you send us a link?" Like, no, because sometimes <laughs> the sound isn't so good, or you know, um, or or it's slightly out of sync on one of those platforms. And I won't mm. mention any just because it's like an off. But you we know, know it's, one. it's never mm. the perfect. But when you're in a room and then you watch it and then you can discuss it afterwards and then you can, quite, not that you're making excuses for it because obviously an audience only ever watches it once and they have to, you know. But but like like you were saying, Anna, that you do feel, you feel the room, don't you? Mm. You it's feel if somebody's uncomfortable. Mm. I, uh, I do agree. However, I did most of It's a Sin in this room 
and um, I managed, we managed to do episode one and then almost episode two, fine cut in person. And then the, all of the assembly and the rest of the episodes and even the post-production was all done online. Mm. But we had very, very long Zooms after every screening. And I had met them in person and it actually worked really well, I thought. Yeah. It really did. I think because I we'd all met and knew each other well enough that we had, you know, in the beginning of lockdown, people would have five hour Zooms and whatever. <laughs> um, it wasn't quite that long, but mm. people, we got kind of comfortable with just working like this. Um, so it didn't f feel that alien by the end of it, I don't think, for me anyway. 